This is the Muse Athena headband. It has both brainwave and blood flow sensors that can detect if you're focusing or deep in a meditative state. And it has training programs to teach you how to do these skills better. In this video, I'm going to talk about the five biggest mistakes that I see people making right now with the blood flow focus training feature of the Muse Athena. My name is Dr. Cody Rall. I'm a US Navy trained psychiatrist that has specialized in brain sensing devices for over 10 years. And I recently interviewed the chief technology officer of Muse Headband on the specifics about how Muse Athena was designed. So we'll have a lot of details here in this video to help you understand what is going on with this focus training technology and how to best use it to sharpen your own focus skills. The current focus training game of the Muse headband has you focus on your phone or tablet screen to make an owl fly. The Muse headband is measuring the blood flow of your brain, and the more that you increase the blood flow to the front part of your brain while you focus, the higher and further the owl will fly. This focus training app has been out for several months, so I've gotten the chance to look at all the questions that people are asking, and we'll address them here. And I think it will help you because we definitely want to take a look at some questions that you might have. Number one, you might not know that head movement in certain directions might affect your score. Number two, you might get confused about what breathing patterns to use during the calibration and in the focus training. Number three, you might not even know how to focus your mind during the actual session. Number four, you might have the owl just drop in the middle of the session when you thought you were focusing well. We'll cover why that might be so and what to do about it. And number five, you might get confused about how this focus training exercise is related to the mind meditation exercise that's already on the Muse app with previous versions. So there's a lot to unpack here and we'll take a look at all that and more right now. And be sure to stick to the end of the video where I'll give you a super easy and quick to implement bonus tip that will be huge help in improving your Muse Athena focus scores as they did with me because I was making a super careless mistake that I think is actually going to be really common with this training exercise and I know this tip is going to help you as well. So mistake number one is moving your head or the headband during the focus training session. Now all current and previous versions of the Muse headband have brainwave sensors and used audio neurofeedback to guide you in meditation sessions. But in this latest version, Muse Athena has brain blood flow sensors that are used to train your focus during mental strength sessions. It still has brainwave sensors, but the blood flow sensors are being used during the focus sessions. The app has a flying owl game in which you sit very still and focus on the screen with your eyes open. The more that you focus on the screen, the higher and faster the owl will fly. The game is responsive to the blood flow in the frontal part of your brain, which increases as you increase your focus. I'll try not to get too technical here, but this background is essential to understand how this system works overall, and this understanding will help us get the most out of it. The blood flow sensing technology is called functional near infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS for short. On the Muse Athena, there is a harmless red light laser in the middle of the device that shines through your scalp skin and skull into your brain and then bounces back to the band that has two pairs of sensors that sense the incoming light that has bounced off your brain. The light data from the skin is subtracted out from the light data from the brain to give a cleaner picture of the blood flow that it's happening inside of your brain instead of any blood flow that might be happening in your skin on your scalp. It's really cool because the app actually displays all of this. If you look at the post-training data, you can actually see the relative levels of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood of your brain on with timeline tracings. Basically, when you increase your focus, it increases the metabolic demands of your neurons for oxygen. As a response, the brain tissue actually increases blood flow to that area, making the oxygenated hemoglobin content go up overall. The rate of oxygenated blood flow to the area tends to be a lot higher than the actual consumption of that oxygen, so the hemoglobin content measured by the red light laser tends to go up when you measure it with this type of FNIRS. Now, as the neurons are sending signals, they are consuming oxygen and creating deoxygenated blood. That also increases, but it gets mostly flushed out of the area so that that overall level measured by FNIRS tends to be stable or decreases slightly during metabolic consumption. So what you ultimately have is a divergence of these two signals as a secondary measure of the metabolic activity from your neurons. 
the larger the increase of oxygenated hemoglobin to the deoxygenated hemoglobin reflects increasing metabolism of the neurons in your frontal lobe due to the activity that you're doing. If you look at the graph, the larger the difference between the red and blue lines and the divergence between them, the more you are increasing the metabolism of your frontal lobe and the game is responding to that. Now bringing us back to problem number one is that these blood flow patterns are actually quite responsive to gravity as we move our head. If you pitch your head forward, you're actually going to get more blood rushing to that area of your forehead and vice versa if you go backwards. So I have to stress that you definitely want to keep your head stable while you are doing the focus training with the Musathena. And what we've been seeing, and this is something that people naturally do, is that as you're focusing, especially if you're using a tablet in front of you and you're trying to concentrate you might be leaning forward slightly to get more and more concentration. What might be happening is that you're actually affecting the positive feedback that way with the Muse Athena Focus Training app. But you don't wanna do that because it's not indicating increased focus, it's just responding to your head position. The Muse Athena software does try to correct for this using the accelerometer and monitoring where your head is and in space, but it's not perfect and really pitching your head forward could affect the positive feedback. And you definitely don't want to do that because if you do it at the beginning of the exercise, it might actually make the owl drop later in the exercise for reasons that we'll discuss here shortly. And the same goes for making adjustments to the headband right in the middle of the session. That's going to change skin compression and have small changes in the geometry in the area of the frontal lobe that it's measuring, which can have different blood flow patterns than your original calibration measured. And Muse co-founder Chris Aimoni said it best, the best results are gonna come when you just sit upright with head level, maintain your posture, and keep your headband stable and in the same position as you do your focus training. Now, if your back gets tired during training or you notice you're moving your head, you might wanna pick a chair with the headrest or rest your back against a couch to minimize any movement. Now, the second mistake I see people making is doing odd breathing patterns during calibration. As you might imagine, your rate of breathing can affect blood flow and blood oxygenation levels. That's why the app seeks to standardize that portion of the exercise by having you breathe along with a specific cadence while calibrating. This is important because it sets the standard baseline for you before you go off and do the focus training exercise. My recommendation is to follow this breathing cadence and try to keep a similar breathing pace while doing the exercise so that you can be sure that the increases in blood flow oxygenation are from your concentration and not from different breathing patterns. Now I have been experimenting with different Wim Hof and holotropic breathing patterns and I'll have more information on that soon. You can feel free to experiment with those methods as well, but just be aware of what you're doing and how it might affect the app's ability to train your attention instead of your breathing patterns. Is we can end up in this mental laxity and we're losing the, the, the vibrant awake clarity that you can achieve when you have a quiet mind. And to the antidote to that is trying to like turn up the energy. And so I really love F nears because, you know, there's a, a very simple exercise you can do where you are intentionally also in a focused state, right? So, you, so it doesn't work if, you're, if your mind goes, right? It's, it's, it's hard to have sustained mental effort. You have to push against some resistance, right? And doing that has an amazing therapeutic benefit, and that is it's helping us turn up the mental activity in an undistracted way. And I think that is, can in a really beautiful way, help to balance out this negative possibility of going into laxity and not staying in this like very awake, aware state. I will say from my training that I've noticed it's actually a challenge to maintain a regular breathing cadence while you're focusing on the app. And I think it adds to the overall experience of trying to remain mindful with present attention and a regular breathing cadence, which contributes to the mindfulness. And that takes me to mistake number three, which is trying to game the signal with mental tricks. We know from certain AFNIR's research, like Dr. Olaf Kregolson's work out of University of Victoria, that if you do things like counting or doing working memory tasks, that will also increase blood flow to your frontal lobe. Now, it can be fun to try these things while you're in an Athena exercise to see how it will improve the flight of the owl, but it does go against 
what the game is designed to do, which is to increase your mindfulness focus. So in general, you want to be practicing open awareness mindfulness to sharpen your focus and use the game's feedback to get your attention back on track when you lose it. So just try to be present, be aware of your breathing in a regular cadence, be aware of the owl and allow your attention to dilate into the scene. That's the true training that the app is trying to improve so that you can maintain mindfulness and pay attention in lectures or in conversations with people. That's what we're really trying to train with the Muse headband. And we do know that neurofeedback FNIR's training like this has been shown with other systems to improve impulsivity and focus in children with ADHD. For more information on that, take a look at this paper from University of Tübingen out of Germany. I'll be sure to post a link to that in the description of this video. And I'll also put a link to my five day sharper everyday challenge below. That's where I teach people how to sharpen their memory, focus, and mental clarity using Muse Athena and other cutting edge neurotech tools. So be sure to check that out below as well. Moving on to mistake number four is understanding what's called the rolling threshold. Now this one can be pretty frustrating if you're not aware of what's happening. Most of you might be familiar with the Muse meditation exercise that uses your brain waves to help you settle down and get into a calm state during meditation. There's a calibration at the beginning of that exercise that basically sets your baseline brainwave levels that affect the entire meditation session afterwards. Now what's different about the Muse Athena focus exercise is that there's actually a moving threshold target. The calibration for the Muse Athena focus exercise sets the baseline for the first minute and then the baseline is continually adjusted afterwards at about every minute marker. We're using a um a very classical neurofeedback paradigm here where basically when you're above a threshold you're getting rewarded and when you're below a threshold you know and you know that's been found for many years in the neurofeedback space to be a very effective way of getting the operant conditioning to happen in the brain on the user side it can be very frustrating right because like yeah i'm doing it and then suddenly you're not doing it and that kind of like transition between the success and failure is something that actually can feel kind of stressful, but it's actually that, that emotional response we're having, which is the key to the reward-based learning. And again, like I said, we're drawing upon sort of like a long history of doing this in neurofeedback. And one of the reasons why we're doing it that way is FNIRS, the measurement itself, has like a big crux with respect to getting it to work in the field for someone doing this uh, at home. So if you're doing pretty well the first minute, but then the owl starts to drop, it might be that the app's increasing the difficulty on you. This is more like traditional neurofeedback systems, like with MindLift, that increase the difficulty of the exercise as you go along. It's looking for more change in either your brain waves or your blood flow. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is get the most change out of your brain during the session as possible. So if you feel like you were focusing really well and then the owl starts to drop, but you didn't change your focus at all, it might be that the game is simply trying to make you work harder to get even more blood flow going to your frontal lobe to allow you to get better results of your focus after training. Now, what I think is great is that you can actually see the data on how much your blood flow changed after the exercise. So you can kind of see like, okay, it increased the difficulty here, but it ended up getting more blood flow out of my brain. I guess at least that way you don't feel like you were getting cheated during the exercise. In the post-training data, you can also see the brainwave patterns that were present during the exercise. But Chris told me that the brainwaves actually don't have any effect over the owl training at this time, and that it is solely based on the blood flow at this point. Mistake number five is expecting the mental strength training session to feel like a Muse mindfulness meditation session. As I mentioned before, this training is quite a bit different than the mind meditation exercises most people have grown used to over the years using the Muse headband. Whereas the mindfulness meditation exercise might feel calming and pleasant and can be done for long periods of time, the Muse mental strength training might feel more strained and draining. This is because it's really training your executive network in the frontal part of your brain to allow you to redirect your focus and increase blood flow. This exercise also has your eyes open as opposed to eyes closed with the other exercise. And I find that just having your eyes open and focusing on something for long periods of time can be tiring as well. So for the past six months, I've been doing the Muse Athena mental strength training exercise every other day for about 10 minutes, and I alternate it with the Muse mindfulness training. So you don't need to do it all in one day and just totally wear yourself out with Muse training. That way your brain doesn't get used to each type of training and you can go back and forth, which I think increases flexibility and neuroplasticity as a result. And finally, for our bonus mistake, don't forget to swipe. This is one that I'm totally guilty of. When I first started doing the focus exercise, 
I forgot to swipe the screen, probably because I wasn't used to touching the screen on previous versions of Muse with the Muse Mindfulness Meditation. This is something new, and on the Muse Mental Strength Training, you actually want to be watching the owl on the game, and it asks you to swipe the screen to make sure that you're paying attention and to help increase your reaction time. I didn't know what it was at first, so I wasn't swiping, and my scores were super low. Once I talked to Chris and realized the mistake I was making, I started swiping, and my scores, funny enough, went way up. So it was kind of a silly mistake, but honestly, I don't know how great the directions really were on the app if I didn't get it. So I assume a lot of you out there are forgetting or not even realizing that you're supposed to swipe the screen while you're watching the owl when it asks you to do that. So those are the five biggest mistakes plus that bonus mistake to help you with the Muse Athena training. If you fix these, I guarantee you'll get way more out of your training. You start seeing better results. The owl will fly further and faster and you really feel like you're getting into a flow state while you're doing the training. Generally, if I adopt a present mindfulness while focusing on the owl and being vigilant to swipe the swipe requests, I get a lot more points. I feel like the training session was productive. And I have noticed that the app wants you to build momentum. So if you're getting really well into a flow state and the owl is flying faster and faster, it doesn't tend to just drop the owl in the middle of the session unless you totally lose focus. So don't worry too much about the neurofeedback thresholding. It should allow you to get some momentum with the owl flying if you're having a good session and really have fun with it. And if you want to check out my podcast interview with Muse co-founder Ariel Garten, where she goes over all the new features of the Muse Athena headband, click this video here and I'll see you on the other side.